Another fact that wasn't taken into account in the original treatment of the hydrogen atom is the fact that the electron has uh, what's referred to as spin. Uh, this is an intrinsic angular momentum, which is uh, sometimes thought of as uh, similar to a spinning top, even though that's not really what's happening uh, quantum mechanically. Uh, and the electron is also moving in the proton's electric field through its uh, orbital angular momentum. And these two effects will combine to give what's called spin orbit coupling. So let's see how that comes up. Uh, so the first thing we'll consider is the fact that the electron, which is a charged particle, is moving in the field of the proton. And when a charged particle uh, moves in an electric field, which we'll denote by the vector E like this, with some velocity, uh, which we'll again denote by the vector, by a vector. It experiences uh, a magnetic field, which is given by this expression. So the cross product between the electric field uh, in which the electron is moving in crossed with the velocity of the electron divided by the speed of light squared. So here, E is the electric field of the proton which has the same charge as the electron. And uh, this is the unit radial vector. We'll rewrite this as uh, so is r squared in terms of uh, the non-normalized radial vector. So this will be r cubed. So plugging this into our expression for the magnetic field, we can bunch up the constants out here. And then we're left with the R vector from the electric field crossed with the velocity vector of the electron. We can uh, multiply the top and bottom here by the mass of the electron so that we now get the following. So the mass of the electron here has now been bunched up in this term here. And we have R cross uh, MV is the momentum we have R cross with the momentum. And this is uh, the expression for orbital angular momentum. It's the classical expression, but it's taken to be, to, to hold in quantum mechanics as well. And we'll denote that by the vector capital L. So what we're left with then is the magnetic field that the electron is experiencing as a result of moving in the proton's electric field is related to its orbital angular momentum. And it varies like the one over the cube distance from the, the proton. Uh, put another way, the magnetic field experienced by the electron is proportional to its orbital angular momentum. So this is the first effect that we have to take into account. The second one is because the electron has spin angular momentum or an intrinsic angular momentum,
Uh, this means that it has a magnetic dipole moment. And you can think of this again classically as a, a, a spinning charge, which becomes uh, similar to having a current. And this will result in a magnetic dipole moment for the electron. And it turns out that we can actually estimate this from a purely classical model of a spinning electron. Uh, and for that, we're going to take, the classical model of spinning electron. This is going to be the charge is as uh, spread out or smeared over a ring of radius A. And this ring is rotating This radius rotating about its axis, which has normal vector n hat, with uh, some period capital T. So the picture to have in mind here then is you have a ring. This ring has a radius A. And uh, it is spinning about its axis with some period T. Okay, so we'll carry this model forward. Okay, so if you recall from uh, electromagnetism, a magnetic dipole moment the magnetic dipole moment is uh, will denote it by mu this is uh, the uh, current times a vector area and the idea here is if you, for our spinning disc, because uh, this has some charge and the charge is moving, this is like having a current equal to the charge over the time it takes for the ring to complete one period. And the vector area will be the area of our ring times the normal vector the unit normal vector of a ring. And the magnetic dipole moment is a vector. And this is our uh, classical model, CL. Putting this together, you have uh, the current, the area of the disk, and the unit normal vector, which gives us the direction of the magnetic dipole moment. Okay, uh, the classically, the spin angular momentum Uh, is given, we'll still denote it by S, it's given by the moment of inertia, which we'll denote by this curly I, times the angular frequency. So this is classically, again, it's the wrong way to, it's the wrong way to think about uh, the spin of an electron, but in this classical model, uh, we'll just take it on faith and see what happens. So here I is, 
angular momentum and omega is the angular frequency of the of the spinning right so for a ring since this is what we're modeling the electron as the moment of inertia is just given by the mass times the radius of the ring squared And the angular frequency will, of course, be related to the period. Omega will be 2 pi over the period. This is for a ring of radius A. And we get that the spin angular momentum has the following expression, ma squared times two pi t. And with this, uh, you get, you have a lot of common terms over here and over here. So we're gonna be able to rewrite the magnetic dipole moment of the electron in terms of the magnitude of the spin angular momentum. So our classical magnetic dipole moment which was q pi a squared over the period times n hat. This one we're going to rewrite as q over 2m, 2 pi m a squared over t. So this over here now is the magnitude of our spin angular momentum. And we still have our direction vector this will be Q to um, spin angular momentum. And, and this is for a general charge Q, uh, taking the charge of the electron to be minus E. This will be minus E. The spin angular momentum vector, which we'll is combined S with N hat over two M E. Here E is minus E, is charge of the electron. Q was just a general charge. So we've just replaced it with the specifics of, of the electron now. So finally, we get that the uh, magnetic dipole moment of our electron or the classical approximation is given by this. Now it turns out that this result differs from uh, the true result derived from quantum mechanics, purely from quantum mechanics by a factor of two. This is known as the G factor. It's actually a little bit different than two, but it's about two, uh, which is surprisingly good considering that this was a fully classical model and some of the assumptions that went into it, like modeling the electron as a spinning ring of charge. And then uh, a very odd thing happens. So we're off by a factor of two, but there's also another relativistic effect that comes from the electron, not just moving around the proton, but also accelerating as it moves. This makes the spin precess. Uh, and the net result of that is that it subtracts, it subtracts one from this G factor. So quantum mechanically, Uh, this would be minus this G factor, E S 2 M E, where G is about equal to two. And then because of the spin precession, which is also known as Thomas precession, The net result of this is to subtract one from this G factor. And this essentially cancels out the contributions of the G factor to, so this is the quantum mechanical, sorry. The quantum mechanical magnetic dipole moment has this extra G factor, which is equal to two, the Thomas precession, 
which is due to the accelerating electron, and it's a rel another relativistic effect, ends up subtracting one from the value of this of this g factor. This is essentially a fudge factor. So it turns out serendipitously that our classical approximation to the magnetic dipole moment of the electron is actually correct. So the classical one is actually very much, very closely equal to the true quantum mechanical magnetic dipole moment of the electron. So now we have uh, the magnetic dipole moment of the electron. We, we have it in a magnetic field that's experiencing because of its orbital angular momentum. And we can combine those two effects together. So the potential energy of uh, a magnetic dipole moment in a magnetic field will be the minus one minus the magnetic dipole moment dotted with the magnetic field. This is we our expression for so this is from the spin of the electron. This was the magnetic field experienced by the electron due to the orbital angular momentum. And you take the dot product between these two. Putting together all of the constants. You get uh, the following term. And now you have this coupling between the spin of the electron and its orbital angular momentum. So we'll denote this by a perturbative contribution, delta H spin orbit. And this is an extra correction that we have to take into account to the potential energy. So this adds a contribution to the Coulomb potential that we originally put in. We can again get an idea of the scale of this correction by looking at the ratio between the spin orbit coupling and the Coulomb potential. We don't compare it to a kinetic energy because this is a potential energy term. And what you end up getting is something like this. Uh, for the hydrogen atom, R tends to scale as n squared a naught, where a naught is the Bohr radius. So this, I guess it's proportional to the Bohr radius in general. And this again goes as the velocity of the electron in the first orbit over the speed of light. So this is again uh, going like alpha squared. So you'll notice that this is of the same scale as the relativistic correction. Uh, so we again expect perturbation theory to be a good tool uh, to use to estimate the effects on the energy of this spin orbit coupling term. In the next video, we'll see how we use perturbation theory to calculate the, the value of this first order correction to the energy.